multiple victims and also quite a number of alleged offenders. From 1960 to 1985, thousands of boys, some as young as 12, were sent here to the Derrick Boys' Home on the outskirts of Sydney for a dose of corrective military-style discipline. But what is alleged to have really gone on here is only now being uncovered by a New South Wales police investigation headed by Detective Sergeant Ben Hallam. When you sit down with them and, and listen to them tell their story about what happened at Derrick and then they break down and cry, uh, it's, it's very confronting. If you tell anyone... He told them to strip me down. I think they were trying to break me. As children, Daryl Stanton, Carl Orme and Gordon Parsons allege they suffered terrible abuse at Derrick. Tonight, the alleged abusers now all men in their 70s are on notice. Criminal charges imminent. These were vulnerable kids from broken families. The tragedy of this is that the people that were entrusted to care for them and help them were alleged to have abused them. What's different about this story is that the alleged victims say that the government official responsible for their care, Derek's superintendent, Alistair Webster, ignored their complaints. Tell me what you feel about Alistair Webster. I think he needs to face justice to tell the truth. I think there's many a kid who's damaged because of the way he ran that institution. For 10 years, he's worked at the Derrick Training School supervising children committed by the courts. Webster is married with five children and emphasises his involvement in welfare. Alistair Webster, now 84, made much of his job with wayward youth to vault into a distinguished career as a federal politician. Even honoured with an Order of Australia medal for his services to politics and education. What did it do to you that he chose to do nothing, to not believe you? I lost faith and trust in everything. You know, I mean, if this man is the boss of this place and he's not willing to even check out the stories of complaints, What's the use? This is all different. It's all changed. On first appearances, Daryl Stanton impresses as the successful and self-assured businessman he's become. This is his first time back to Derrick Boy's home, confronting the terrors of his childhood. To this day, I still have nightmares because it happened on a daily basis. <laughs> they were just bastards, you know. We were caged children at the mercy of a major serious pedophile ring. When Daryl first came here as a young teenage boy in 1978, he says Derek's superintendent, Alistair Webster, boasted of how he ran the place with harsh military discipline. Well, he's po pointed out, he goes, see those boys over there and they're all these sort of, you know, guys with tats and they look pretty menacing. They're my dingoes, you know, no one's ever escaped from here. And if you do, when you get caught, you won't want to know what the ramifications are. Derek was presented as a caring government training school, teaching young offenders new skills. But behind that facade, Daryl says he suffered a brutal regime of abuse. They'd uh, call out against the wall, stand at ease, with your nose on the wall. And then you hear some kid being dragged out, sometimes by his hair, sometimes by his thumbs, and given an almighty whack of this big leather bound uh, daily report diary across the years. Even more terrifying was the dreaded isolation or punishment cell, nicknamed the boob. I uh, had a big metal door on the outside with a big brass lock. Very thick walls. Uh, it was very dark and very cold inside. They used to lock kids up in there for you know, anywhere between two and four days at a time. And what was that like, that experience? It's terrible. It's, um, you're sleep deprived. You got absolutely spare. 
One accused abuser, Christian Bullens, is now 72 years old and lives in Queensland. Four decades ago, he was a staff carer at Derrick. If you wanted to go to the toilet during the night, you stand at these at the end of your bed. This particular night, I was at the urinal and uh, Bullens came up behind me and started molesting me. He said, you know what happens to lions in this, in this institution? Referring to the isolation. Do you remember this place? Yeah, I do. That's happened over there. This bathroom hasn't changed at all in 40 years. Neither has Daryl's memory of the abuse he says he suffered here as a slight 14-year-old boy. Well, I still remember it to this day, so it never leaves you, ever. You left upset and then confused and hurt. And angry. Well, anyway, I would like to get out of here to tell the truth. Daryl decided that to escape was his only option, but he was caught and returned. He was taken straight to Alistair Webster's office. And so this was Webster's office here? Right there, and it has not changed at all. And when you came to this office, hmm. you complained. You raised your concerns about the way you were being treated? Yeah, I said we were being abused. Why did you run away? But Daryl says Webster didn't want to hear of it. Webster wasn't happy. Four days in the boo. Gave me four days. In what? the boo. Yeah. I was marched straight in and this time the dingoes came in. He's standing in the doorway of the boo at the cell. They started bashing into me. I'm really sore at this stage. I think they've broken my rib. Alistair Webster's watching this? Yeah. One of the kids gave me a big slap across the face and he's gone, not the, not the head. Not the head. What happens? He's gone, OK, hold, hold him down. He's ordered them to strip me down. And I'm screaming at him, what are you doing? Check him for contraband. I'm thinking, what the hell is he talking about? I'm completely naked. You can see there's nothing on me. And all of a sudden, there's his hand being forced right up my rectum. Who did that to you? I think it was the head dingo. Yeah, and I'm screaming on that by this stage I'm I'm now crying. Was Alistair Webster present? Did he say anything? He just stood there, I'm looking up there and I'm screaming and he just had this cold look on his face, he, like no expression, almost like a grimace, you know. It's just hurt the moment. And then it and then uh, he turned on his heels and the door slammed and, and I was left there. When they complained as a child, they were thrown in solitary and beaten. Lawyer Jason Parkinson is now helping many Derrick victims sue the government to expose the abuse they say they suffered. So many of them have come forward from different times of the institution's existence telling the same stories about the same abusers in the same places within the institution that uh, yet they n don't know each other and they've never met each other. From the moment I left um, Derek, it was a downward spiral. I hated everyone. I wouldn't trust anyone. I'd strike first, ask questions later, and, I, and that eventually I ended up going to jail. And. Uh, my life couldn't have sunk any further than that. Daryl's abuse left him with lifelong medical and emotional problems. But then he met the love of his life, Felice. He credits her for his rescue. He says too many other boys were lost along the way. I wanted to come forward and, and tell my story because too many kids have died, too many kids are in jail. Too many kids are on drugs. He now wants justice from his alleged abusers and the man he accuses of letting that abuse happen, Alistair Webster. He's held up 
in the public eye. I think his reputation was made as a federal MP, as somebody who championed the cause of youth. No, he didn't. He destroyed many a life. He nearly destroyed me. He nearly destroyed me, and if I wasn't mentally strong enough, I would have been a victim as well. For 25 years, thousands of children were sent to Derrick Boy's home on the outskirts of Sydney. But many of the children who came here now allege they suffered horrendous sexual and physical abuse. How seriously is your strike force taking these allegations? Extremely serious. Uh, child sexual assaults in any form is one of the most horrific types of crime that you can investigate. And can you give us any idea at all of how many persons of interest there are who are the subject of investigations? Um, there's quite a few. Gordon Parsons was just 12 years old when he was first sent to Derrick. Soon after, he was sexually assaulted by one of the most notorious accused pedophiles at Derrick, its medical officer, John Munger. How scared were you? I was terrified. Completely terrified. Time to shut my mouth. He said no one would believe whatever I said. As other boys did, Gordon says he complained to Derek's superintendent, Alistair Webster. I said, Mr Munger has made me have sex with him. I said, I'm not, I don't want to do this anymore. What was Webster's reaction? He said, are you OK? I said, no. And he goes, I'll look into it. But Gordon says each time he complained to Alistair Webster, he was punished with solitary confinement in the isolation cell. And worse, Munger's sadistic sexual obsession with him was allowed to continue. He said, we, um, we're going to circumcise you. We have, you. we have permission to do that. But Munger wasn't qualified to do circumcisions. All he knew was basic first aid, and he botched the operation. All of a sudden, I woke up and I just threw myself straight because the pain was just phenomenal. Blood was going everywhere. We went straight to Windsor Hospital. Today, the old Windsor Hospital is closed, but it still gives Gordon nightmares. Records show Gordon was admitted with a problem circumcision. A real doctor was left to try to repair Munger's botched job. So basically, you haven't been able to have an no. adult sexual life? No, not at all. And this is because of that botched circumcision, yep. you say? Yep. Gordon Parsons says the abuse he suffered at Derrick turned him into a criminal as a young man. These days, he's doing well as a long-distance truck driver. His abuser, John Munger, is now dead. But Gordon will never forget the man he says ignored his cries for help, Alastair Webster. He did nothing to protect us. He was, you know, his job was to oversee the people looking after us. And it just never happened. So that's you? That's such a beautiful, happy-looking family photograph. You can see all the love there in that family. And that was all taken away from you, really, wasn't it? It was, yes. Carl Orm was 14 when he was sent to Derrick. He says one of his tormentors there was a welfare officer, Robert Barratluff. He used to punch me, slap me. One time he slapped me right across the side of my head. He, he knocked me down. He also squeezed my private areas. Carl also says he reported Barratluff's violence to Alistair Webster and that his pleas were ignored. Did you tell Mr Webster that you had been physically abused and sexually assaulted? Yeah, I told him everything and he just wasn't interested, he didn't care. You're full of crap, mate. He said, you're full of crap. You know, it's not the first time he's, I've heard this, mate. He says, you're all always complaining. He says, you uh, expect us to look after, then all you do is win your powers. This is the boss who's got a responsibility to protect you, to care for you. I was expecting him to do something about it. Carl accuses Webster of doing nothing. 
He says Barraclough's abuse actually escalated after he complained. And all of a sudden the hand went on my mouth. What did he say to you? If you tell anyone, no one's going to believe you. No one is going to believe you. He says, just be quiet. I tried to scream out, tried to yell out, but he just kept squeezing his hand tighter on my mouth. And he sexually assaulted you? He did, yes. There was yet another alleged abuser at Derrick. Carl Orm also says he was taken out of Derrick, plied with alcohol, and raped by this man, William Thomas Wright. He's now 77 and lives in a retirement village in Canberra. He would come up and sit right next to me. I said, I don't want to do this. He says, it's OK. He would say things like, you know I like you. He says, um, he says, <laughs> he says, I only do this because I love you. And then he would force himself onto me. I gave in after a while. I stopped fighting. No, it's, um, it's bad. Mm -hmm. Especially when nobody takes any notice of you. Five years ago, Carl told his mother, Anne, about the abuse for the first time. Break my heart, actually. Especially when I saw the look on Mum's face when I told her. Well, she, she grabbed hold of me and cuddled me and said, Sorry, son, why didn't you tell us earlier? And I told her I couldn't. I just couldn't. Excuse me. Of the men accused in this story, only William Wright and Alistair Webster responded to our written questions. They both deny all the allegations made against them. The fact that if someone committed those crimes is heinous, to cover it up is just as bad. Lawyer Jason Parkinson still finds it hard to believe just how many alleged abusers worked at Derrick. These institutions were a pedophile's paradise. It was systemic, right through. Um, these are groups of pedophiles uh, who looked at each other as fellow travellers. New South Wales police detective Ben Hallam plans to begin charging more of those alleged abusers very soon. Should the alleged perpetrators be nervous? Yes, they should. So charges are imminent? Yes. For years, the lost boys of Derrick kept their silence about their alleged abuse. It's only now, as men, they've found the courage to come forward. They want their alleged abusers held to account. But they also want the man the government entrusted with their care, Alistair Webster, to explain his failures. I didn't care. Wasn't interested. He was allowing lots of young boys to get hurt. This man doesn't deserve what he's got, I'm sorry to say, and that's the truth. He doesn't deserve to be like a, a pillar of the community because he's not. Any information about abuse at Derek Boy's home, please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 